Okay, so welcome everyone to the workshop of creating a new Vita branch. Um, we would like to start with introductions, both of ourselves and with you guys, to also learn um, why you're interested in this workshop. Uh, to start with myself, I'm Claudia, I'm a founder and I'm the current president of Vita Portugal, and I was DG of the latest MEU, so MEU Lisbon. And I'm Vasily Key. I'm a member of uh, Beta Greece. I am currently uh, head of PR and vice secretary for Beta Greece. Um, yeah, and we're organizing uh, MEU Athens 2019. Uh, so yeah, if we can have a short introduction from the people that are uh, here, just so we know why you were interested in the workshop. Sure, uh, I'm Casper. I'm uh, busy founding uh, Better Netherlands at the moment, and I will be the uh, future president and the DG for first MU in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm Matej, I'm a member of Better Czech Republic, and I'm sort of more sort of like observer here. So, thank you. Yeah, Plano and I have organized MU Vienna for some years, and uh, now. I'm here because first of all, I have heard of the British Transcoordination Workshop last year in Berlin. <laughs> and second, would like to kind of get the price of whether it is worth it all to have a bit of branch in Austria or not. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Vincent, uh, and I'm just kind of curious. Great, thank you. I'm also observing. Good. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Oh, and my name is Nick, and uh, I would be curious to hear about your experience in Greece and Portugal. Um, because at Beta Europe, uh, one of my responsibilities is to provide support to the new branches, um, to everyone on the Casper who is um, willing to create a bridge. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing your hands on experience. Amazing. Okay, so um, we have prepared a set of issues that uh, you usually face when creating a beta branch and we are going to tackle them uh, one at a time so how to assemble and keep your team motivated what are the first steps you should take administratively speaking um, and so on and running the daily life of the association and also what is specifically different with a beta branch that doesn't happen in other associations um, so First of all, given that we're part of a federation, newly established, when you decide to create a branch, it is good to uh, approach the consultative partnerships team because they're the ones that are responsible for overseeing this process and giving you guidance and supporting everything you need. Um, this contact is publicly available and very easy to obtain. I guess like everyone here has um, even personal contact with, with someone um, that could easily give them that information. Mm -hmm. Well, in my case as well, um, when I was um, interested in um, Beta Greece and I was first thinking about it, I contacted the um, then um, head of CMP and he immediately uh, put me in contact with the people that have already uh, founded the um, uh, the uh, Greek branch and uh, I think this is also very useful uh, the, the moment you contact the CMP team you are basically um, uh, you can basically get the contacts of people of other people of your nationality or other people that might be interested in joining that team uh, yeah this is how I joined Vila Greece uh, yeah information it's, yeah it's super easy to just send an email because of course, we have some registry or even beta associates or members that are from your nationality that will be interested in joining, but just don't have easy access to the information that there is a branch being created. And so the CNP team can create as a, can be a facilitator here. Um, of course, you should be focused on assembling a team and how do you assemble a team is crucial and is very important in defining of how your association is going to play out. Um, I wouldn't say that the priority, at least in Portugal, um, was giving specific positions. Okay, so we had team a team that was uh, committed to the project, a team that wanted to create a project, but we didn't immediately um, assign PR fundraising. That was much later. For us, um, the most important thing was to attract people that wanted to be a part, and then after that, uh, everything would be easily solved. 
Mm, on that note, uh, in Villa Greece, we although we do have a, um, we have assigned positions uh, like PR and uh, fundraising, etc. Uh, in reality, a lot of our work overlaps because we're still dealing with uh, like the, the main the main issues like uh, getting funding and, and getting partners. Uh, so, it, yeah. Um, even though the positions are there and even though everyone knows what they should be doing, we're all kind of helping each other anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, that's I, essential in the beginning at least. Mm -hmm. I would say that in, in the first like six to seven months of Vita Portugal, um, it wasn't, this happened, okay, so people had a notion of what they were good doing or not, um, but they weren't exactly doing it. It changed drastically from the moment we started seriously organizing MU Lisbon. And then when you organize a conference, then you need to have accountability and you have to have specific tasks defined and people in charge of things in order to create as much order uh, as possible. And I would say that considering the two environments, so the association itself and the conference, the association and the members of, uh, of the boards of the, um, we'll get into that later, but the members of the supervisory uh, bodies are much more relaxed in their functions than the MEU um, organizers. They have more, much more specific things. Yeah. Um, another point that I'd uh, like to raise is uh, how to attract the right kind of people. And what I mean by that is, uh, well, from personal experience, so um, Beta Greece, uh, there's been an attempt to uh, found Beta Greece uh, before us, as you may or may not know, and that was uh, not particularly successful because of lack of communication from um, the Greek side. And when we started reformulate, reformulating the association, we were uh, faced with some obstacles. We were approached by members of the previous group, we, and they either um, discouraged us or they try to join our um, our new group, and we were happy that uh, the latter was happening. Uh, however, we wanted to ensure that we were uh, that we had a team that shared the same values um, as as we did. And uh, in order to do that, what we did is we had uh, informal face to face or Skype meetings with uh, with the people that wanted to join our team. Not an interview per se, but more of a getting to know each other um, kind of thing because uh, ultimately you need a team that works, yeah. you need a team that shares your values, your social vision and if that, and you can't really, yeah, you can't really play around with that, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in Portugal we came together after MU Strasbourg 2017. Uh, that group was highly motivated and of <coughs> course dragged by Claudio. Um, and he was very persuasive, but it was very important to us to unite participants from previous MU Strasbourg's. So um, what happened was he had been an organizer for two or three years, and so he knew personally the participants, and that made it so much easier to gather more people. And so we just started informally. Um, in, in Portugal, even if you don't have a legal entity, uh, you are recognized legally as an informal group. And so we started just like that, even applying to funding and, and all that, as an informal group, as an informal association. Um, but when we created uh, the Beta Portugal League as a legal entity, um, all we required was names. We needed nine people to create the association. Um, but they were all either participants from U.S. Strasbourg or friends or acquaintances of ours. So it, it wasn't, at that point, we weren't wor worried about reaching out and getting a lot of people because what was essential was creating the association and then moving forward, um, we'll see how we get the, the people. And now what we have is an extended management board. So we open positions uh, for head of PR, head of fundraising and officers. Um, that do then join and become part of the, the extended management board. Um, what I would say as advice is it is always important in youth associations, and I've been a part of many, many of them, um, the friendship factor. You're not paid. You're spending a lot of your free time. You have crazy schedules because you have meetings in different time zones that end at 2 a.m. 
or uh, you have participants that decide to call you um, at random times. So it is important that you actually feel the love for the association because if there's at any point a lack of trust or a lack of friendship between the people that are in the association, that is going to be so demotivating that people are going to quit. So, for example, when I was organizing MU Lisbon, the last month for me was spent mainly making sure that the team was okay. So, if there were any conflicts, solve them. If there are any things to say, say them before anything else. You need to make sure that the team is okay and that they're all getting along. So, arrange dinners, uh, go out to drink, uh, become friends with those people because it's in the beginning when it is not so professional as it might become in the future you need that friendship to get the effort and to get the motivation going. I guess a good question to this would be, uh, how do you do that when there's a clear geographical distance between yeah. the members? Because I'm, I'm based in Bristol and pretty yeah. much uh, the majority of the members would be the Greece are in Athens. Yeah, we also have that in Portugal, so like, the majority of our team is not even from Lisbon. Um, I'm, I was based in Lisbon. Um, but the majority was based in Porto. So what we do is, for example, when we have a general meeting, we would schedule uh, different groups uh, across the country. So we would have Lisbon group and Porto group, and those would go out together. And if we could, we would travel along and just try to see each other. So, for example, during the summer, I went to Porto and I met my vice president and we gathered a few people. Um, it is not always possible. Sometimes traveling is expensive or time consuming. And if it's not a vacation, then it's it's horrible. Um, but I would say those simple things that creates community in the internet. So create memes around people that are um, sort of recognizable. So for example, there are a lot of memes and selfies of myself uh, in our groups because that helps people like start commenting and start um, making pokes at each other and that's even if it seems like little when it comes the time that they're present and at the same room preparing a conference that's going to start the next day it makes an entire difference because they know how much fun they can have with someone great uh, i guess now we're moving on to the next bit which might be unnecessary or a little bit repetitive for some some of you but i think it's quite useful for the newer uh, newest uh, uh, members it's uh, basically admin and and like the information on how to get started and we'll kind of share our um, respective experiences so essentially uh, as some sure you're all aware uh, a new branch is essentially first and foremost the ngo in your home country so this means that you need to check on procedures on how to establish that NGO. Uh, depending on your on your country, the, the time it takes uh, to establish and write the documents it varies varies massively. Um, well, in for us, what am I writing? Yeah. there are also uh, fine lines in the um, governing law in each country, which changes how many people are actually required to form such an um, such a, an entity. So in our case we needed one legal representative and then five members uh, to establish the NGO, uh, and that was enough. But I think in Portugal you said you needed something Yeah, we like said that. we needed nine, because in Portugal, when you create an association, you need to have three bodies. You need to have the board, you need to have the general assembly, and you need to have uh, the fiscal, fiscal council. And each of them has to have a president, a vice president, and then according to the one, either a secretary or treasurer. And so that makes a grand total of nine people that needed to, to sign everything. Um, and yeah, obviously we have the uh, need of a statute, uh, which uh, in order to be um, registered in the um, tax office of your municipality, uh, for, for, for statute writing, some people choose to do it with lawyers. Uh, that can also, that, that's the easiest option, that's the easiest way out. Um, but that can get expensive. So I know for us it was uh, at least 400 euros um, to have a lawyer, uh, yeah, to have a lawyer draft draft the statute for us, uh, not including anything else. Uh, so we uh, obviously um, we chose the uh, the other way, which is to write it ourselves, and it was not it was not particularly difficult. Um, I wasn't actually involved in the process, but from what I've heard, 
uh, the, the, it just needed it just needed you just need to be careful and then we had someone a lawyer re read it read it through and ensure that it is um, it is legally sound uh, we based our statute on uh, the statutes of uh, Bida EV, Bida Europe and other uh, similar NGOs it was not particularly difficult so I wouldn't don't get discouraged at the beginning if you're not familiar uh, with, with the language and and the terms used, but yeah, it's definitely doable. You can definitely do it on your own. Um, yeah. In the Netherlands, it, also, it is obligatory to is it? do it by an attorney. So. Okay, all right. And it's even cheaper if you let them write it. Really? Yeah. Oh. Okay, good. Uh, so in our case, for example, so we took a status of a Portuguese association just because of the legal terms that we weren't familiar with. We took the status of Peter Pol Polska, um, and of course, then confers with with Peter Europe how how it should be done. Um, in Portugal, the registry is around at least three hundred euros. But what that entails is that the notary actually gives you legal advice on your statutes. So um, before them being uh, written or approved or signed, the notary gives like all the recommendations needed to to fix everything that's 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 required. Um, so for us, it was a sort of a mixed process, not only us writing, not only a lawyer writing, um, but uh, an assemble. Mm -hmm. So with regards to accounting, uh, yes, of course. I also got a little bit chip in, like, for example, with registration on Peter Europe, we're just in Brussels, and I get, it got quite expensive, it is quite expensive, I think we are now about on a figure of 1,500 to Europe, so yeah, that gets, it, gets, it can get expensive. Mm, yeah, certainly. Some, some advice mainly for that. So, in Portugal, one of the reasons that led us to create Emil Lisbon and Beta Portugal was the fact that there was no similar projects or simulations in our country uh, at the time. And we felt like for most Portuguese students, it was financially impossible to go abroad and to have this experience. So our goal from the beginning was always keeping in mind, keeping it the lowest fare possible or so, something like that. The only reason why we had quotas, even in the first place, was to make sure that we had the money to pay the registry. Um, and once that was done, so for example, in, in our statutes and according to our last GA, um, it is still policy that you pay quotas once in your lifetime. Um, and then you become a member. So that's something that you also have to take into consideration how you're going to get the funds to pay for everything um, because that's all going to get registered uh, sooner or later. Yeah. Um, is there any other comments? No? Okay, so we're moving on to uh, accounting. Uh, you could obviously hire an accountant, uh, but, well, well, uh, we don't have one, uh, but we have people with good accounting background, and I think that's essential in the beginning because you need to have uh, people that keep hold of all the receipts, uh, that file everything correctly, especially during the tax period, uh, so that you can claim money back and for auditing purposes, of course. Uh, so I think this is an essential person to look out for in the beginning uh, of the association because, uh, yeah, it could get messy otherwise. Um, yeah, after, after you have... Uh, after you have registered, the only thing that um, you, you, you have to do that is uh, uh, extremely important is to create a bank account. For us, it was a matter of two or three days. It, 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 was, it was immediately, uh, immediately done. Uh, and that is essential because you can't get funds from sponsors and Erasmus Plus otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is the stamp, for which, from which we had... Uh, I don't know what, about your experience, but we, we, uh, it was not particularly easy because we didn't know exactly what was required. So uh, I remember uh, Yoga and Fenya, um, they got in touch with other branches and uh, they immediately helped. Uh, they posted an MEU universe or something. So mm -hmm. yeah, see there the benefits of uh, Peter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Reach out and people help you. Yeah. yeah, regarding these two topics, for example, bank account, even though it is something that should be easy to do, for Peter Portugal it was quite a mess. Really? Um, because no one advised us that we were supposed to have an article in the statutes uh, saying who were supposed to manage the account. 
Um, and so no bank was accepting our statutes, no bank was accepting our uh, minutes, nothing. And so we had to have um, a board meeting and just the minute of a board meeting saying who was going to manage the, the accounts um, was enough. So that's something I'll, I'll just make sure that um, when you're writing a statute, make sure that you are you are explicitly saying who is not only externally representing the association. So for the, in our case, it's any member of the board um, and who is managing the, the account. If either you say X amount of number of the people in the board, or you say the treasurer, or you say the president of the treasurer. Uh, you just need to make sure that that's um, that's already there. Otherwise, you might have issues with the bank. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. Then after all of that was done, the actual registering with and um, establishing a partnership with Beta EV was was pain free and easy, and it happened within a matter of uh, whether couple of days or something. Uh, it's a matter of just um, uh, signing the signing the papers and that was basically it. Uh, yeah. Any comments on admin? Any questions on admin? Any questions on getting started? I'm assuming you've kind of already done yeah. half, of, half of that. Yeah. Um, so moving on, um, we would go into the daily life and running of the association. Uh, I would say, as I briefly touched previously, this is one of the most hard parts. Um, because if people are not truly aware of the dimension of the beta project, of the scale that you often have to act, or uh, the amount of work that you have to put in, um, people are going to quit and they're going to leave you empty handed and with a lot of things on your lap. Um, so it is important not only to ensure the first point we said about getting the right kind of people, but then to keep them motivated and to make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that can be quite hard because if you get too trusting, um, you can actually um, lose track of what's happening. And if you are not so trusting, you end up messing up the environment that at least I wanted to create among my team. Um, so, as I said in the beginning, we had a very small group of informal meetings, dinners, drinks, making sure that every time there's a plan for beta, there's always a social, there's always something going on, um, or that you create a space that is recognizable as the beta space. So the restaurant that every be every beta member goes. Um, we have one in Lisbon. And, <laughs> yeah, so uh, every time there's something, that restaurant. Um, so it creates uh, small things that make people feel at home, that make people feel comfortable. Um, when we started organizing the MEU, um, of course, the meetings had to become a little bit different because time was at the essence. Um, and so we had three types of meetings during the organization period. We had general meetings with everyone every two weeks where it the main goal was for them to criticize what was happening and to learn like directly DG to officer uh, what is going wrong and how you can improve it and just creating more lines of communication. Then you had team meetings, so the PR meeting, the <coughs> fundraising meeting, um, where at best we would try to get one of the DGs to attend uh, whenever possible. And then, and this was every week, and then we had DGs and coordinators, so the heads of the teams meetings every week as well. So we would have that one before the team meetings, we would set the priorities and make sure the information is passed along. Um, it is very hard to keep such a schedule. Um, it can be very demanding. You get exams and you get your job in the middle and you forget the schedule. Oh my God, it's been two weeks since we've, since we've had a meeting. Uh, don't worry. As long as uh, people are still active or responding on Facebook and you're getting some sort of information, you can schedule the meeting for the week after that. Um, it doesn't have to be rigid, corporate, uh, uh, mandatory meeting. 
um, you just need to make sure that uh, when you're organizing something like this, that you have enough information to make the right decisions. And you cannot do that without having uh, proper feedback from the teams. Yeah, well, in our case, we clearly have not reached that um, point yet because we're n newly founded. We've been around for, what, um, four or five months? Uh, but what we do, and I think we've, we've, we've managed to strike a really good balance between professionalism and, and, and giving freedom to the uh, members to, to do their job, is we have bi-weekly reports. Uh, so uh, as a head of PR, I report every 15th and 30th of, uh, of the month. Uh, should, should, should have reported, actually. Forgot about it. We'll do that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just send a, a couple of lines to the secretary, and I'll say this is what I did the, those two weeks. Um, just not as a, not, not because I want them, not because they want to check up on me necessarily, but because it's good to have a backlog of what has happened and and see which people have done their job and which people might not have been doing their job, and then see do we, do we need put possibly more people in that side of the team? Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, that has been really helpful. Uh, it also ensures that we don't step on each other's toes, with, uh, in quotation marks, obviously. Uh, yeah, because again, as I told you in the beginning, um, what we do are uh, kind of over overlaps, uh, especially at the beginning. So it's good. It's good to know that not a lot of people are focusing on one thing and then we're forgetting another. And we we, we managed to do that with the reports. It really has helped. Does anyone have questions on daily life, how to run things? Okay, then I, I think there, there's a part here that probably Nick could give some, some input, which is the support of a federation and the support of the, that Beta can offer. I would say uh, most honestly that Beta Portugal would not exist today and it would have not had a new Lisbon as grand as it was without the support of Vita Europe, not only financially with the loans that were um, uh, talked about previously, but also the amount of expertise that you can get from Vita members is uh, super valuable. So if there is any, any questions, it is super important not to be afraid to ask them. Um, there are stupid things, for example, how do you select a chair or how do you open a chair application? That is something I had never done in my life. Um, and it is important for you to get, because there is a standard and there is a way that has been learned over 10 years and counting how to do things. And so it is not worth it to waste time and just uh, ignore that access. Um, so yeah, I would say that the know-how um, is definitely one of the most uh, valuable assets that Peter has to offer because even though you're starting an association from the ground and even though you you yourself might not be very experienced the learning curve is going to be super quick because you're going to have access to everything you need um yeah yeah no you you, you summed that up perfectly and again even though we have not reached a stage yet as Peter as Peter Greece uh what i've noticed is every time we have a question, even for the silliest, smallest thing, like the STEM, and, and every time we're unsure, uh, we either uh, direct the question to, uh, to uh, Peter Europe, or uh, we just post in the group, in the MEU universe, or, or other groups that we're using, and immediately, within, within a matter of minutes, we mm -hmm. have an answer. And I think that's, that's extremely important, especially in the beginning, where you don't really know what is required of you, uh, or, 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 you know, what other, what other things you might need to do. Um, yeah, that's that, that was super helpful for us. Uh, and obviously, another another important thing is. Um, oh no, you have mentioned that, so yeah, don't okay. want to do one second again. <laughs> um, I would just say that even in practical things, being a part of this network can be helpful. So, for example. When looking for sponsors or when looking for partners, for example, the European Commission or the, your national parliament, it is super easy to just show them the MU Strasbourg website and just say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is our people that are behind us and these people are also in some points involved. 
Um, so for example, there, I have tons of funny stories. So we went to the representation of the commission in Lisbon and we had prepared a booklet, uh, because we wanted to get some funding from them. And we sent it uh, via email um, and then printed it to deliver at the meeting. And the person that came to meet us, um, she took the booklet and she said, it's so funny um, because one of the people that you have in your photos is a former intern of mine. <laughs> Uh, so she had been working in London and uh, Tamit was her intern and she was like, oh my God, this is one of the best interns I've ever had. Um, and immediately those connections play out. And so when you use the Beta brand uh, instead of Beta Portugal or Beta Greece or Beta Poland, that's small. Like you're acting as an entire association and that weight carries a lot. Uh, especially, I don't know, in, in smaller countries like, like Portugal or in Southern European countries Absolutely. where that kind of influence and power um, is, is important. Um, you can get a lot of attention, even media attention, just by the fact that you are an international NGO yeah. that is acting locally. Yeah, people, people in Greece are prone to not trust NGOs uh, and we have had difficulties finding partners. But the moment we started um, branding ourselves as Beta Greece, the international youth NGO, the European youth NGO, they were all immediately like, okay, so show me what you've done. And we've showed uh, a couple of uh, um, flyers from uh, other conferences down before. And this really, really is a really good selling point. Now, I, if we would like to, to discuss a bit um, what are the the few first steps that you could give in terms of activities. So the main project in the flagship project of, of Vita is MEUs. And there is uh, currently um, some sort of discussion uh, trying to understand what is most effective um, if going straight to an international MEU, if doing national MEUs, there are Vita branches doing uh, MEUs in high school with different formats. Um, there's a workshop on that later, later. Yeah, there's a workshop on that. Um, and so there are several levels where, where you can begin. Um, in my personal experience, and this is where um, I, I would stress more about the, get, the fact of getting the right kind of people, we did a national MEU, in, which means um, in a national language, in Portuguese, in March uh, 2018. And then we had in September 2018, the international MEU. This was, so the first MEU was hard to organize because we had no materials in Portuguese. We had um, very few things that could help us. And the team was very, very small. Like we were the nine that created the association, but some were abroad, some were working, some were just available just for high, very important things that were necessary to contact a speaker or a politician or something. So the team itself, three, four, five people at the most organizing an MEU. Um, but it was a massive success organizing it in Portuguese. We had over 90 participants from all over the country. So 30 from Porto, 30 from Coimbra and 30 from Lisbon. So quite spread across, uh, across the land. Um, and what happened is one third of this applied to be organizers for this, for the conference in September. So we had a team of 36 people organizing the, the, the MU Lisbon in September because they saw what, they, what it could be done. Uh, they saw how it could be improved. And because of that, they were passionate about doing it again. Also, the fact that you're using a national language uh, or that you're offering that possibility um, actually triggers that more people are going to apply or at least different people because at least in Portugal, some are still very afraid to speak English. Absolutely. Uh, some degrees don't use English often. So for example, law degree doesn't use the English often because the legislation is in Portuguese and so they're mainly focused on that. So we had a lot, a lot, a lot of law students that were trying to get a bit of practice of EU law, but without getting the, the harm of English. And then they eventually did migrate to other conferences internationally and they went 
to Brussels and to Sofia and to so and many other conferences and became organizers of the international MU, which I think is key because they knew what to expect and they have seen how things run. Um, and it's very hard when you're beginning in the, the MEU and our first MEU, we, we truly felt that. So only in the active part of the team, those four or five, only two of us had been to one MEU the year before. So it was very time consuming and very, um, very hard to explain to people what the MEU standards are. But once they see them for themselves, they're able to get that immediately. They get the vision. And that can be uh, yeah. key to, to ensure a proper MEU, a proper international MEU. Yeah, uh, I'll echo your uh, comments about uh, the language barrier. That's definitely the case in Greece uh, as well. People are just simply discouraged um, because once you think MEU, an international MEU, okay, so there's the normal student, the normal Greek student in my head would say, oh, well, they know English perfectly well, I can't really uh, I can't really compete with that, so they just don't apply. But if you start that process early on, from high schools potentially, or from from, uh, universe, from um, uh, having an MEU in the national language, you kind of bring more people in from earlier on into the process, uh, and uh, you, you incentivize people to apply people that in other ways wouldn't have applied to apply and then you kind of hook them into the MEU experience and then you end up with, uh, uh, with, with, with highly competent people that are not actually that old. So if you start, if you start the process from, uh, from high school uh, and then you do that in your national language and then you, um, you keep going, you, you in a sense train people from mm -hmm. like the, the age of 16. Uh, and that is beneficial on a, on, on a lot of levels, uh, both for the national branch and uh, and, and the European bit. Yeah, so we're definitely considering doing, considering, um, doing that in, in Greece as well. Um, we'll see how it goes, but clearly it's a success story from uh, from the looks of Peter Portugal. It works. It, it really works. Um, just, just the fact that we had so many organizers that came from that conference. That first one that was horrible, that had no dinners, no socials. Uh, we only had the daytime planned. Uh, but just that, just the environment of the debates itself. Uh, so you don't need to, okay, you, you should put a lot of effort into it. But if you're not able to, you can do a simple thing just to start, just your first step. Um, just make sure people have fun. Uh, create a few dramas in the parliament and they'll be hooked forever and they'll just <laughs> Hopefully. never leave. Just like we were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's about it from yeah. us. So questions, problems, concerns, comments. Um, when the Netherlands are going to start off with an international conference, just because the level of English is, yeah. uh, is quite high, but uh, yeah. yeah, I think that would mm -hmm. be fun in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, for us, uh, uh, how do you do the project management? Any good software, you advise, other things? Um, project management. So, I would say go away from Facebook. This, this is a regular policy, go away from Facebook. Uh, you need to create a, a space where um, people are working properly and they know when that app is ringing. It's serious, it's business, it's not something like that. So in terms of managing the whole conference, I think that's very important. So for example, we use Discord, which is usually, yeah. okay, so usually gaming, but since it has a voice channels for us, it was very useful. Um, and- It's always uh, workplace on Facebook? Yeah. Which is yeah, but it's it looks so similar to Facebook. But it's still not yeah. Facebook. Which yeah. is the important thing. You need to separate work from play, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I personally don't like that app. Um, but there, there are tons. So Slack, for example, I think Strasbourg, when I was an organizer of Strasbourg, uh, we used Slack. Um, and there are plenty of others. You, you can even use the groups on the beta forum um, to, to have the team assemble there. 
which is useful for them when creating um, emails or creating the website. It's useful to have everyone already there. Um, but regarding the project itself, I would say to look at the files that the CNP team has. For example, the most important file for me was the calendar. So there is a calendar, an Excel sheet. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it already. Yeah, um, okay, and you have the time like with the weeks, what is supposed to be happening at each point. Um, and of course, when it gets closer to the end, you have your own dynamic and you're figuring it out and like certain needs come at certain times, you cannot control it. But in the beginning to get things moving, um, I would say just read carefully the guides provided by Beta Europe. Um, that calendar was lifesaver when I had to get people together. Hey, you're late. Uh, it's not me saying it, it's the higher power. <laughs> it's Beta Europe saying that we're late. Um, just um, that sort of thing. But do, do you have any specific questions? That... No, no, this is enough of Okay, them. yes. Also. I have a question regarding the uh, working language of the organizing team. Okay. So I have the impression that at least now some teams work entirely in English. Mm -hmm. But I know that um, some um, established branches prefer to start first in their local language as a working language. Mm -hmm. And I wonder uh, how you integrate then international um, organizers in the team and how you make mm -hmm. the decision if you have your documentation and chat or whatever in English or in your local language. That actually happened with me in Portugal, didn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell us? Yeah, so basically I joined the organizing team of uh, ME Lisbon and uh, I think you guys were uh, were speaking in Portuguese. Yes. But the moment I was in the group chat, they me everyone immediately turned to English. Uh, so they showed their respect in that way, uh, which wasn't an issue at all. And I think uh, the, the yeah. level of English was amazing, so it, that, that, that didn't pose a, a problem. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a matter of ease. Uh, the thing is, when you're organizing the international conference, since the materials are in English, since the content is in English, the chairs are most likely not from your country and the commissioners as well, there is already a big part of the work that has, has to be done in English um, because you're dealing with those people. In terms of, for example, logistics, where you have essentially local teams, um, of course, it's national language is going to flow. Um, and we, we had, at first we had a, a team entirely in English because our DDG was, um, was German. And so when he was part of the team and we were trying to get people from outside to join the organizing team, this before our first MEU, um, we had everything in English. But then after I quit and we uh, didn't have any other foreign organizers um, and we had a lot of new Portuguese incoming, we just moved on to Portuguese for day-to-day inter-team uh, communication, everything with shares and all that in participants in English, even with the Portuguese participants. Mm -hmm. and we, we do our, we only communicate in English uh, in deep degrees. Primarily because of our, because uh, our president is is, is from Singapore, but uh, I think nevertheless, even even if she was from Singapore, we would have we would have uh, spoken English just because uh, a it's good practice for everyone in the team, and and b uh, it's just it's just an international it's an international conference we're organizing, so it, it just makes sense for us. I mean, cause I'm assuming that if we start planning uh, like local local uh, support things, mm -hmm. then it, Greek might have to, to kind yeah. of happen. It, it's not a matter of have; it will just happen. Yeah, it's uh, when you're, you're going to the supermarket just to oh, get like coffee breaks. Of course, um, it just uh, yeah. just happens that the national language just flows. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions? I guess a little bit quite a small question, like when I think Mother was before, like what is the difference of organizing an MEU, just like organizing an MEU, versus organizing it as at Peter Branch? I guess you're more in time. Okay. Um, I would say it is different the kind of access you have to the network. Mm -hmm. And I would say it is different um, yeah mainly the access to the network because that affects all the other parts. So 
if you're part of beta getting the right chairs or getting chairs that are already evaluated or that you have some kind of feedback on them is easier through the network um, it is easier to get the participants because you have access to more groups or you have access to more channels where you can communicate and like divulge your event um, but then I had something on my mind um, oh for example the, the simple matter of like fundraising uh, presenting the beta brand, uh, presenting yourself as something bigger or something larger. Uh, because if you, for example, in our case, we have about 50 members. If we go to a sponsor and we say we have 50 members, no one's going to take us seriously. We didn't have pictures of our own conference. We didn't have a previous experience of other conferences. Our organizers were very young. Um, so without getting the support from from Beta Europe and getting that brand, uh, it would have been totally impossible to do it. But maybe I think Nick. Yeah, you can. yeah, I wanted to say on that front that basically from the Beta Europe perspective, we try to be as supportive to conferences which are also not part of the network. Um, we do not uh, demand or request. Um, for a part of the conference to be part of the beta network as in having a beta bridge behind it. But um, when it comes to the benefits, I think that now with the federalization in place, the biggest benefit is basically, uh, for example, beta Portugal, beta Greece, beta Netherlands very shortly, they also have a say when it comes to the decision making at the European level. So basically, they'll be able to influence the Federal Association, the directions it goes to, what we promote, how we promote it, how we do it. Um, so that's, all, for me, one of the advantages. Of course, our priority is to apply for funding at the European level, which we will want to redistribute to the national bridges afterwards, keeping some of the funding for Beta Europe for projects like this, like the symposium, which involve all the bridges, but also giving every branch some funding for the administrative costs for um, for even supporting the conference. So basically, by being part of the beta network, they'll be also, they also have uh, access to this funding. Many of the conferences that um, are um, MEU, but uh, at the same time they're not part of uh, BETA, as in having a national bridge behind them, it also happens due to the fact that um, the NGO, the association in question, uh, they have several projects. For example, MEU Zagreb and Hermes, or, or the um, MEU Yash in Romania. They have several projects where MEU is just one of the projects, so that's, that might be also an idea. But we haven't really, we haven't really incentivized existing um, conferences to to turn into beta branches. We think that we should, we think that the initiative should come from their side if it's if they're interested, uh, and if they are, we will be of course supportive. I think being an association is also good for a continuity because you always have a management board, and um, you don't have only one team that after a conference has to frantically look for a new team and you have the board that can call the community and uh, make, make sure that the knowledge is as well possible. Yeah, so for from our side I think that yeah, we're is, done. Yeah, all. Any other questions? Great. Okay, thank you so much.